Well, good evening, everyone. Glad you're with us here in person or on live stream as we come to celebrate uh, uh, the post-Thanksgiving season and the uh, Christmas season. Let me give you a few announcements as far as our Christmas activities are concerned. Um, first, we'll have uh, on the 7th of December, ladies, you're going to have your annual ornament exchange at the Woolslegels at 6 p.m. Bring hors d'oeuvres and ornament to exchange, hors d'oeuvres to share. And uh, if you have any questions about that, speak to Mary Clark or Floyd Pulliam. Uh, second note that on the 16th, Saturday the 16th, we're going to have a uh, special uh, Christmas social here at the church. Uh, mark your calendar for uh, desserts, coffee, hot chocolate, Christmas folk music, cookie decorating for the kiddos, uh, great desserts and fun fellowship. That's 630 to 830 on Saturday the 16th here at the church. Uh, I'd encourage you to uh, invite your friends and uh, even your enemies as well, and we'll have a great time. Um, note that also our Christmas Eve service will be on the 24th, Sunday, but not at the 6 o'clock hour. We'll have it at the 5 o'clock hour instead, uh, our service of lessons and carols. So mark your calendars for that flight change. That's all I have for us this evening. Let's take a few moments and prepare our hearts to worship our God. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea when its waves rise, you still them. The sea's waves may rise, but our God stills even them. Let's come and praise our God. Let me encourage you to stand and sing our opening hymn of praise. You'll find that on page five in your liturgy or number 196 in the red hymnal. Come thou long expected Jesus. Let's stand and sing. Sin. 
Our great God in heaven, we approach you this evening with hearts full of praise for who you are and what you have done for us. Truly, Lord God of hosts, there is none who is as mighty and faithful as you are. We praise you, Lord Jesus, who has come down from heaven to be our redeemer, our shepherd and our friend. You are the true God. You are the living God and the everlasting king. Your kingdom is an eternal kingdom. Your dominion endures from generation to generation. We thank you that, that you never leave us nor forsake us. We ask that you would help us not to be distracted by the things of this world this evening, but that we would focus our attention on you, our loving Heavenly Father. We pray this through the matchless name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this evening is from the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verses 15 through 27. And we continue to read about the, uh, the fall of Jericho in this passage. So let's, let's hear the word of God. Starting in verse 15, reading to the end of the chapter. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day 
and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her and her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any way of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing of dest for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. And as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. And they devoted all the city to destruction, both men and women, <clears throat> young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Joshua laid an oath on them at that time saying, Curse before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation. And at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Praise be to our God. We now come to a time of confession. We will listen to Psalm 53, verses 2 and 3, found in your bulletin. God looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not even one. And we know if we look at our own lives, we are those that are in the same boat that we have sin that consumes us. And then we come to this time now to confess our sins privately before the Lord, and then I will lead us corporately together. Oh, Lord God, we, we thank you that, that you are a gracious and compassionate God, one who is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. We know that even if we have become new creations in Christ, that we will continue to struggle with sin on a daily basis. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But we thank you that you will not let us be tempted beyond what we are able. 
but with the temptation will provide the way out that we may be able to endure it. We thank you for the gift of Christ for our salvation. And we, we praise you for the grace that we have through him in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and hear our assurance of pardon from Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Amen. We now have the opportunity to confess before others our confession of faith using the Apostles' Creed. Uh, it's found in your bulletin. Uh, so, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of lust. Amen. Our hymn of comfort and trust is found on page six in our bulletin, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come now into the courtroom of our Father and bring our desires before him in prayer. Please bow with me. Lord, 
Let us pray. Oh, all-knowing Lord, your eye roves over this earth. You see and you search into the nooks and crannies of our lives. You know all things in your creation. You know how the hummingbird moves around. You know how the butterfly flies. You know every color, every blotch that's on that butterfly. Lord, you have peered into the depths of the instincts of the animals, you know what makes them tick. You have gazed down the deeps of the Marianas Trench, the Pacific Ocean. You have gazed upon the heights of the Himalayas and Mount Everest. You, O oh Lord, know all the things of this earth. And Lord, you know us. You have peered in the very deepest recesses of our hearts. You know not just our health, but you know what we think at all times. Nothing is hidden from you. You know our desires. You know the things we can't even name. You know how much we fall short of you. You know our history. You know our past. You know our biographies. And Lord, we come to you as the Apostle Paul came to you with our lives, with our baggage, with our past and our present and our future yet unveiled. We come to you. We ask that you would encourage those of us who are despairing. Those of us who look at Paul and his life and see how awful he was and think we're just as bad. We pray that you would show us that your grace in Christ reaches deeper, deep enough to cover all of our sin. And yet some of us come as posers. Some of us come tonight playing the game of Christianity. Some of us come with pride in our hearts, thinking that we're actually pretty good. And we have the same problem that Paul had. Paul the Pharisee, Paul the pure one, Paul the... Israelite of Israelites, Paul, the tribe of Benjamin, Paul, the best one. We come and we ask that you would chip away at our confidence in our fleshly advantages, whether obtained or inherited, whether we've done them or not. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would strike against our pride, that you would give us that humility that your word calls us to show. And Lord, we ask that you would Make that occur, even as we have given thanks a few days ago, even as we've enjoyed a, a bit of a holiday weekend. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, renew our minds, not just in the season of Christmas, not just in the season of Advent, but particularly beyond that season for the rest of our lives, that you would make us more and more like Christ. Let us seek that lasting peace, that true joy found in him, that hope that goes beyond the Hallmark movies, that goes beyond the uh, slogans of today, that goes to the core, that you would make us people in our homes between siblings. You would give peace and true love between spouses. The same. That measure that models Christ's relationship with his church, that he sacrifices for her to wash her, you would make husbands able to do that for their wives. In the response of the church to Christ, her Lord, in gratitude, you would give that same amount of gratitude to the wife in response. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would allow that to be the case, not just for families, but here in your church. You would allow us to love Christ more. We pray that you would continue to bring into our midst those who are being called out, those who are being sanctified. We pray that you would bless these upcoming events that we have for the ladies and for the church, not as events per se, but as times and places to show Christ's likeness, to show that humility you call us to show. And yet, Lord, we do not pray simply as those who have biographies of our own. We pray for the spiritual biographies of countless others around the world today. We ask that you would be with um, our, our, our friends um, the Wantrops over in Newcastle, you'd bless them, particularly uh, care for Anna and her, uh, the child within her womb, that you would give to her uh, health and through her baby health, and, and you would grant them a, a glorious and joyous uh, Christmas uh, at All Saints. Thank you for their blessing us, and we pray that uh, we may have been a blessing to them as well. Uh, Lord, in a, in a day of war and strife, Rumors of wars, we pray for those in places like Israel and Ukraine. We pray for those who are suffering under agony, and yet those who perceived even today the joy of family reunion. 
And we ask, Lord, that that would be a picture of the way you reunite us to you, to our Christian family. We pray all these things, trusting in you, in your son, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, friends, let me encourage you to turn to the first page of the New Testament. <clears throat> it's not halfway through your Bibles, but uh, more than halfway in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to begin in the evenings here. Series in this Gospel, timed providentially at the Advent season. We're going to begin looking at this, uh, what Martin Luther called the unnecessary part of the Bible. Well, Luther's wrong on that point and uh, several others. But he calls this the unneeded part of the Bible. One poet about 200 years ago called this section we're going to read a barren page compared to the beautiful Psalms. Well, I'm going to show you why all those people are wrong. Uh, this evening, we come to read from what the old school calls the begats. That's why we have the name here, the, uh, the begat, so-and-so, begat, so-and-so. Uh, we're going to get into that this, uh, this evening. Matthew 1, first chapter, first verse, all the way through verse 17. Let's come now and pay careful attention to what is the true and needed and necessary and vital word of God through the pen of Matthew by the Holy Spirit. Let's seek to store it up in our hearts through faith. We read this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abiah, and Abiah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Akim, and Akim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. That's from the reading of God's word. Let's pray and ask him to bless it to us. Oh Lord, we thank you for your living word. We pray that you would show us this family tree, show us whose it is and whose we are in it, namely Jesus's. For we ask this in his name. Amen. Do you know that in Russian fairy tales, you ever have a little conversation with me, you can ask me about Russian fairy tales. I took a class in college on them. In Russian fairy tales, you can always tell it's a Russian fairy tale because it begins like this. Across 27 lands, in the 27th kingdom, in the 30th country. What's the point? It's a made-up place. It's a fake place. 
It's not a real place. You can't get there. That's how we start, right? Once upon a time, there was a princess. It's very important to see here that when we open the pages of this gospel, this good news, this story, Matthew does not begin by saying once upon a time. He does not say fairy story. He does not say legend. He does not say myth. It's not Star Wars. Once upon a time tells you this didn't really happen. It's a pretty story. It'll make you excited. And then 30 minutes later, you'll be uh, bored. No, 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 no. He says the book, the record of the Genesis, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And that means he is grounding everything that happens in space and time and real history. And of course, the problem is we come to we come to real history and we're really bored by the real history. We come to the list of names and we're not really enthralled with the real list of real people. What do we like? We like to turn the page. We like chapter two, the wise men. That's fun. That's Christmas. This is not Christmas. And yet Matthew doesn't think that, right? You have to actually let the Bible tell you what's important. And for some reason, Matthew thinks this is really important to start off with. Chapter two, the Christmas scene does not make sense unless you know chapter one. The begats, the genealogy. Why is that? Well, first and foremost, as brief introduction, what Matthew is saying here is that the gospel is not good advice, it's good news. Advice is counsel about what you should do. News is a report about what's already been done. You know, at Christmas time, who comes to tell the shepherds? Messengers, we call them angels. The Greek word for messenger is actually angel. You send angels. And the messengers, the angels, come to the shepherds and they don't say, here's what you have to do. They don't say, get over there right now or else. They say, no, glory to God in the highest. I'm going to tell you good news. Here's what's being done over there in the manger in Bethlehem. And what's been done changes everything. That's the reason why Christmas, we're going to find that out these next few weeks, Christmas is not about how to live your life with peace and joy and good happiness. It's not about good vibes. It's not a sweet thing. It's not the hallmark saccharine story. The Christmas story does not teach you three lessons you can take away from your Sunday service and go home and live it out. It's not an inspiring story to tell you how to live. It's not Charlie Brown, even though Charlie Brown's better than most of, you know, the other shows that are on these days. I mean, think about it. What would the Christmas story, what would Matthew's gospel be telling us to do? Go be shepherds outside? Well, I don't think so. Have childbirth outside in a manger? I hope not, for Alexis' sake. But see, God invites us to put this in history. He says, you must know that this was an actual, real event. And the history shows us one clear person, a child, a baby. To us, a child is born. This, this evening, I want to show you three things about this child. Three, three lessons that Matthew, from these names, from this genealogy, he wants us to learn about Jesus and the meaning of Christmas. First, we're going to see the promised child. This child, this Christ, this Jesus, he is the promised child. Second, he is the prostitute child. He's the promised child. He's the prostitute child. And then he's the peace child. Promised child, prostitute child, peace child. I did the peas for y'all. You're welcome. First, he's the child of promise. He's the child of princes. He's the promised child. Look at verse 2 right here. Matthew begins by saying, Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, and so on. He connects him immediately to the patriarchs, the princes of Israel. Remember that God had made a covenant with Abraham. And in that covenant with Abraham, he had said that in your child, in your offspring, blessing is going to come to the whole world. In Abraham's seed, the whole world would be blessed. That was the promise. 
And notice that Matthew tells us Jesus has in his family tree at the big family reunion of Jesus Christ, he has Abraham. All the way through Jacob's son, Judah, so that by, we, by the time we arrive in verse 6, we find that David, the king, King David, is one of the direct ancestors of Jesus. And then David, verse 7, the father of Solomon, the king, to whom God also made a covenant promise. 2 Samuel chapter 7. I read that God declares one of David's sons will sit upon his throne and establish his kingdom forever. That's the first opening point we see. Matthew wants you to get who is Jesus Christ. He is God's appointed heir. He is God's appointed son to that great covenant promise to Abraham and to David. The blessings offered to the whole world, promise of the whole world. He is great David's greater son. Now, if you were Jewish, if you were actually Jewish, all that I said, you would have been like, yes, this is it. That would have been an incredible claim. And most of Matthew's first readers probably were Jewish. You see what Matthew's telling them? He's saying the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger is their long-awaited Messiah. The son of Abraham, the son of the royal tribe of Judah, the direct heir of David, Israel's greatest king. Which makes Jesus what? From a Jewish point of view, what does that make Jesus? It makes him better than Paul. We heard this morning how Paul has the best pedigree. No, he doesn't. Jesus has a better pedigree. He's the ultimate inside man. He's the insider. He has impeccable credentials. He is the child of promise. He is the prince, you might even say, the prince of promise. And, of course, this proves here just off the bat something about our God. Through thousands of years of history, God did not lose sight of his promises. Do you think he lost sight of them? I mean, if you had been an Israelite, if you'd been a Jew, and you were looking at this time in this location, the first century, you would have thought, I almost guarantee you, that God had lost sight of his promises. I mean, you think things are bad. You may think things are bad in America or whatever. You may think things are great in America. I don't know. But I guarantee you that America hasn't been around anywhere near as long as that. A thousand years? But God keeps his promises. Do you see how God remembers his covenant unto a thousand generations? The triumph of the patient grace of God. He has determined to save a people through this son. And that's really the first part of the message of Christmas. What's the first part of the message of the Christmas season? is that even though God seemed to be AWOL, absent without leave, even though he seemed to be totally gone, he's not, he's working. He's saying, I don't come through at the time you want me to come through or you expect me to come through. My promises may not come the way you expect them, but I always come through. I always come through. You can trust me. You don't have to try to take matters into your own hands and force the issue. You can trust me. That's the first thing we see here. The promised child. Second, the prostitute child. Christ is the ultimate insider. He's the ultimate one, the ultimate ideal. And yet you look closely and a few things should shock you. Matthew is equally clear that the prince promised child is the pagan prostitute child. First, just notice the fact that there are women in this genealogy. You probably don't need to be a historian to know. It's probably common sense, I think. You probably don't need to be an expert to know that in the ancient world, the ancient genealogies hardly ever had women in them. Why? Because what was the genealogy back in the day? It was your resume. I mean, today, your resume tells nothing about your family and everything about what you've done. Back in those days, their resume told nothing about what they've done and everything about their family. It was just the opposite. That's why, for example, the, the villain of the Christmas story, King Herod, we actually don't know. Historians do not know quite what his ethnic background was because King Herod would always doctor his genealogies. He would always fiddle with them. He would erase names that were bad, that he didn't want, and he would add in ones. And women in those days, well, of course, uh, don't have social standing. 
They don't have much status. But here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, proudly on display are women. And not just one, but multiple. Look at verse 3. He mentions the pagan woman, Tamar. Verse 5, Rahab. We heard it tonight from our reading in Joshua. Rahab, the prostitute. Rahab, the pagan. Her descendant, Boaz. Verse 5, Mary's Ruth, the Moabite. Not an Israelite. And then in verse 6, look at verse 6. We read that Jesse was the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now, it's interesting, of course, because Matthew omits, he does not mention the name Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, famous David and Bathsheba. Why does Matthew do that? Now, in, in, instinctually, 21st century Americans that we are, reading the Bible through our own eyes, we say that's insulting. That's really offensive, Bathsheba wasn't just the wife of Uriah. You know, if you're a, a woman today, you might say, I'm not just somebody's wife. I'm my own woman. But you're missing the meaning. you got to think about it here. Matthew's not attacking Bathsheba. Think about it for a second. Is, um, is Matthew saying that both Uriah and Bathsheba are Hittite pagans? Is that why he doesn't mention her name? No, he's already mentioned a pagan. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth. Is he embarrassed about the fact that she was an adulteress? No, Rahab was a prostitute. That doesn't rule her out. That doesn't rule her name out. Most likely, Matthew omits her name in order to highlight David's shame rather than her shame. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. The point here is that how did David get Solomon as a son? He slept with another man's wife and he had Uriah killed. He doesn't spare the blushes of David. And then keep reading. The rogues gallery keeps coming. The line of kings descended from David. Some are great, but some of them are pretty bad. Among the worst is in verse 10. Manasseh, the father of Amos. Manasseh, we're told way down, way back in 2 Kings 21. You can read a story you know, this week if you want to. In verse 9 of that chapter, we're told that Manasseh led his people to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. 2 Kings 21, verse 16, we're told Manasseh filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. He was a monster of a man. And so right alongside Abraham and the promises and the, the princely, the, the ultimate insider, Jesus Christ, we have Jesus Christ, the portrait of a man who is the son of a prostitute and the pagans. Of course, some of them become trophies of God's grace, stories of remarkable tales of redemption and rescue. Rahab and Ruth. But not everybody. You see, particularly Matthew wants you to know that Jesus Christ is not just descended from these people. He's descended from these people like Tamar and Bathsheba and Judah and David at the point of their very sin. That's why he brings up Perez and Zerah by Tamar. That's why he brings up Uriah's wife. Because at the very point of their complete falls, Judah and David, that is where Christ comes from. He is saying the very best person here, David, the very greatest person here, King David, on his own record, on his own merits, he does not deserve to be at the family of God. He does not deserve to have a seat at the table at the family reunion. He is the black sheep uncle of the family, mighty King David. Nobody deserves here. On the basis of your own goodness, you do not deserve a seat at the table. But on the basis of the grace of God. I mean, look who's at the family of God. Look who sits at the reunion table. A prostitute, a socially, ethnically marginalized woman, and a king. They're all equal. They're all equal. You see, Jesus Christ comes to really good people, and he comes to really bad people. But there's another shock here that you may have skipped over. Look at verse 14. It's in verse 14. Look there. We read, Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Akim, and Akim, the father of Eliud. Here's a man named Akim. 
Akim is the father of Eliad. Who is Akim? <clears throat> the best scholars on this question give us these words. Akim is unattested. You know what that means? It means we have no idea who he is. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows who he is. What does that tell us about the genealogy of Matthew? Of course, if you're skeptical, you're going to say, well, this, this guy made it up. He's, this guy, Matthew, he made up these names. You're sticking them in there. No, he didn't. What does it tell us? I mean, if you, if you look at these words, what is he saying? He's saying this. It's a very critical point because it's probably speaking to your life. Jesus welcomes average, mediocre nobodies. In the family of Christ, it's not just the superheroes. We all love the superheroes. It's not just the supervillains who get a seat at the table. But it's you when you've grown up and you've lived your life for years and you realize that your dreams of changing the world and making an impact and being amazing when they've been beaten down by real life. I mean, isn't that what we think happens? Isn't that what you think happens? You know, when you're a young Christian, you say, I can go do everything. I can really fight against sin. I can go and change the world. And then, you know, the wiser Christian will say, oh, just wait till you get out in real life. And 20 years in the row, what happens? You're working an average job. You're living an average life. You go into an average church and you're an average person. You haven't changed the world. You haven't killed anybody. But you haven't saved anybody. So what do you what do you do then? And I think again, this is where most of us are going to end up. Most of us, I'm going to go out on the limb and say this: in 200 years, nobody's going to know your name. Just like I came, nobody's going to know your name. So here's the question: Is there a Jesus for you? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Jesus comes from mediocre people. He comes from mediocre people. He comes from the good and the great. He comes for the sinners, the wicked ones. He comes for the kings like Asa, who began well but faltered towards the end. He comes for tired people. He comes from the faltering and the weak. He comes for wallflowers and for celebrities alike. So doesn't that give you such comfort if you're a Christian that he has inscribed your very name? that nobody else may know. He knows. He knows who Abihud is. We have no idea who Abihud is. He knows who Abihud is. And some of these men even here mentioned, they're not Christians. They're not believers. Rehoboam, Joram, they're not, they're not believers. So what does that show us? That grace does not run in the blood. Sin runs in the blood. We need a redeemer. His name is Jesus Christ. So if you're a weak, poor nobody or a powerful, wealthy king, a famous woman or an unknown man, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're the town drunk. It doesn't matter if your sin is flagrant. It doesn't matter if your sin is polite and hidden, alone with you in the middle of the night. All you need to know is that your state of death and evil and sin is where Jesus has you. He's come for dead souls to raise you to life. Because though he is eternal God, he has Come into this world. He has taken on flesh. He has assumed human nature to be born from this family tree. Though he was rich, he became poor for your sake. Rejoice over that. Rest in this one. Marvel with this one. That's the gospel. God gives you a family that will always celebrate Christmas with you. Maybe you have a great family. Maybe you have a bad family. Doesn't matter. This is your family if you're a Christian. That's why Matthew starts off with this. This is your family. Because it doesn't matter if you're a hitman for the mafia. It doesn't matter if you've been living inside the gates of hell for years. You are somebody by God's grace whom Jesus can be proud of as he rescues you from being a hitman for the mob. He can show you off. He wants you in his genealogy. That's why Hebrews 2 tells us he is not ashamed to call us brethren. He's not ashamed to call us family. Do you ever toss at night when you feel like somebody snubbed you in a conversation? Do you ever feel like people aren't appreciating you? Do you feel like nobody's giving you any respect or honor? Who cares? Compared to this right here, he's put you in this family. 
Who cares if no somebody snubs you? Who cares if you feel like you, you, your contribution to the conversation was not appreciated? Who cares if your idea was run rush on over? You're in this family. Do you see what's available in Christ? So what is Christmas really about? It's not a clean, bright Disney story of a beautiful little family and their adorable baby. It is the divine rescue mission for which Jesus Christ was born, a mission Matthew's gospel will tell us later on that would require his death to actually accomplish the heart of the Christian message. The heart of the Christmas message is that you and I are all messed up, guilty, broken down, ruined robes. You and I belong in the robes gallery of mediocre sinners. That's the sad thing, isn't it? We haven't even sinned well. I mean, think about it. You haven't stolen a, from a bank. You haven't robbed a bank. You haven't done anything super naughty. In your sin, you've even been like so many of these people, mediocre. That's the sad thing, isn't it? But precisely for mediocre, guilty people, Jesus Christ died. Although he was the true child of Abraham, the true heir of David's throne, he was rejected and condemned and outcast, not because he did anything wrong, but because you and I did all the wrong. He embraced the rejection that you deserve. He did that at the cross. And that is the true wonder of the Christmas story. And it is a story that nobody else in the universe has. You understand that, right? When you go out this week and you're talking to people, what matters out there? Outside the church, what matters? Who you are. Pedigree. Money matters. Position matters. Achievement matters. Personality matters. But in here, in the family of God, leave that out. That's not something that must rule us. What must rule us? The grace of God and the gospel. Do you see how incredible the gospel is? Do you see how pervasive the grace of God is? The grace of God is even in the begats of Jesus. The gospel is so radical that it's even in what Luther thinks is the unnecessary part of the Bible. This stuff right here. That's how thick the gospel, that's how rich the gospel is. That's what Christmas teaches us. But there's one last point, of course. It's not just that we have the promised child, not just we have the prostitute child, we have the peace child, briefly. Look at the very end. Isn't it odd in verse 17 that Matthew gets into math? I mean, he's either a writer, not a mathematician, but he tells us, he counts them up, verse 17. He says, by the way, there are 14 generations from Abraham to David and 14 from David to the exile in Babylon and 14 from the exile to Jesus Christ. 14, 14, 14. What's 14? 2 times 7. What's 3 14s? 6 times 7. There are 6 sevenths of generations. And if you're a modern Westerner, you say, so what? That's weird. Don't know why it's there. Let me connect the dots. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the seventh seven that makes 49. You know, if you look back at creation, the seventh day is the day of rest because God rests on the seventh day. And in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, every seventh year, you have the Sabbath year. Every seven years, you don't work the field, you let the field lie fallow and let it rest and restore its nutrients so you can harvest it the next six years. But every seventh Sabbath year, every seventh seven, Leviticus 25 tells us is to be a jubilee year. Every 49th year, there's a jubilee year. What's a jubilee year? Jubilee year is the year in which every debt is forgiven. Every slave freed. Everybody who had lost part of their family, family and land because they made a bad investment. They got in hock. They got in debt too bad. What happened? They got their land back. Free of charge. It's a weird thing in the law of Israel. As far as we can tell, they never actually did it. They were never actually that radical to believe God. Every 49 years, you were to celebrate a jubilee year. 
to reflect upon the ultimate rest that God is giving you that day. Not once a week rest, but ultimate peace, ultimate well-being. Do you know what Matthew is saying? He's saying this. Here's a jubilee year. Y'all never actually got it done in Israel. Jesus gets it done. He brings the jubilee rest. He brings that full rest. He relieves you of all your debts. He gives you ultimate lasting peace. And you say, okay, well, that's nice, Pastor John. That's a, some, some fun little numbers, some math, but what did that mean for me? How do I actually get this rest? Well, let's start with this. Do you recognize how radical the grace of Christmas Jesus is? Do you see that you don't have to keep proving yourself to everybody around you? You don't actually have to keep putting up the facade. You don't have to prove yourself to yourself. You can stop doing that. You can rest from that. You need rest from performing. Or other people are just scared, right? My family's falling apart. My job's falling apart. My money's falling apart. My health is falling apart. I don't know if this Jesus guy can help me with any of that stuff. Well, he can't pay your bills. That's right. He can't pay your bills. But that's not the great problem you have. The great problem you have is that you're scared of owning up to your failure and your debts. And Christ says, I come and I bring true and total and complete rest that will last forever. I did it for Rahab. I can do it for you. Do you want rest just from the overwhelming monotony of the world? And that's why a lot of people, you know, take up uh, going to the gym. They take up, you know, uh, watching movies or playing games. They, they take up sports just to get away from it all. You go to a movie, you watch a play, you read a book. For 30 minutes, you feel like, yes, that's great. Good triumphs over evil. That's exciting. And then I have the real world where I have people who are mean to me and I have health problems and I have death coming and I just have a lot of issues and the world's unjust and not fair. And Christmas is just one more of those little 30 minute shows you can watch and you feel fun on the inside and then you're done. How do you fix that? Why is Christmas not just one more sweet movie? Well, the Jesus whose birth we celebrate was actually born, A. B, he was born as a child of promise, but he did not come to save the princes. He came to save the despairing people. He came to save the cynics. He came to save the guilty. And when you trust him, when you actually look to him, you say, not my life, but his life. What happens to you? You actually find that the entertainment stories you were looking to, the fairy tales and the movies you were looking to, they have their reality in him. That when God makes a promise, he fulfills it in Christ. And what is his promise? 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Jesus is God's son from heaven who rescues us from the wrath to come. Jesus is the rescuer. He's the rescuer from the insider and the outsider alike. For those with the pedigree and those without the pedigree, those with the prestige and those with the baggage, your present mistakes, your guilt, your despair, your cynicism, none of that matters ultimately. None of that is any impediment to the promise of God in the real mission of real life. You see, only the gospel, only the Christmas gospel makes every encounter you have, every person you come into contact with, every moment of your day, exciting. Knowing that good has triumphed and will triumph over evil. If it's done so in your life, you know it's going to happen for sure everywhere else. Let's pray. Almighty God, we praise you that you have given us so great a salvation in, in, in these words. We ask that you would show us once more where our rest is seen in Christ. We thank you that he comes not just for the great and the good, but for the bored, the mediocre, and the bad. 
that he transforms us, not simply into good people, but into gospel people. We pray that your word might strike our hearts and show us more deeply how to love him. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let me encourage you to stand. We sing our closing hymn. You'll find it on page seven. Oh, love that will not let me go. his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. See you next week.